All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Antonio Poe, the CEO here at ExecTech. Welcome to our session, Cooking the Books, Problems and Solutions webinar. We are privileged to have with us four of my colleagues, Mario Fazikas. Many of you will know Mario. He is with us here at ExecTech. Mario is a C is the director at um, ExecTech, responsible for fraud risk management. He's a certified fraud examiner and an accredited facet. As you know, he's known in the industry for the training that he provides, so we're privileged to hear from him today. Joining us is also Emil. Emil is a good friend of mine with over 16 years of litigation in, um, as an attorney. What adds to Emil's special skill is his interest in risk management. He's in fact certified in ISO 3100 um, and is able to then provide a combination of his legal skills, commercial and corporate governance, along with the risk skills uh, as part of his dispute resolution to his clients. Emil comes from the company Erasmus Mutaum, and um, we will share with you uh, Emil's contact details along with the two of our other panelists today. The third member of the panel is Mbulelo. Mbulelo is a co-founder of InvestSure. He's your typical problem solver, as you'll hear from the presentation today. He brings fantastic skills from an actu actuarial, capital management, and risk management. He is joined by Shane. Shane is the CEO of Investure, uh, an, in an entrepreneur at heart. He's a chartered accountant, and together they will co-present a portion of today's session. Some house rules before we kick off. As I've said, please remember to stay on mute. Um, there is a facility available to chat. Please use the chat to ask questions throughout the presentation. We do invite you also, if you do have a, a question that simply cannot wait, please raise your hand and the host or the presenter will allow you to participate and ask your question. At the end of the session, we will take a Q&A session where again you will have an opportunity to interact with our panel. And if all else fails and you don't get to say your say or ask your question today, um, as I say, we will reach out to you via email and make our information or contact information available. So um, we are here to assist in every way possible. Ladies and gents, without further ado, let me hand over to our hosts and panel. Uh, Mario Fizikas, over to you. Thank you, Antonio. Good afternoon, ladies and gents. Good to see so many of you attending. Um, let me get straight into it. Um, I'm going to look at the, the problems. What is financial statement fraud? How do these crooked executives cook the books? And then I'll hand over to Emil, who will look at the legal side, and then Mbolelo and Shane. So, if you look at occupational fraud, there are three categories. Corruption, asset misappropriation, and fraudulent statements. We're going to be focusing primarily on fraudulent financial statements. And I'm briefly going to take you through all five of them to show you we need to understand if a director is under pressure, CEO, CFO, how would he or she cook the books? Because we need to understand how they operate in order to try and catch them or, or prevent it. So if we look at the most common frauds out of those three, it's obvious it's asset misappropriation. It accounts for 86% of all the fraud cases. Financial statement fraud, only 10%. But look at the damage done, the severity. So we're looking here at the average um, fraud loss being nearly a million US dollars compared to 100,000 for asset misappropriation. So let's unpack those five types of um, financial statement fraud schemes. We have improper asset valuation. So the directors would overvalue their inventory accounts receivable or fixed assets to make themselves look more profitable and earn bigger bonuses, of course. Then we look at improper disclosures. Anything bad they don't want to tell you about, so they want to reduce the severity or leave it off totally. So for example, um, liability emissions or significant events. They may have a fire or a flood which is gonna impact their business and they would not want potential investors to know about that. The obvious one, fraud and related party transactions. I wanna know if I'm investing my money in this company, are they giving work to their friends and family at my expense? And of course, changes in accounting policy. Subtle things like when 
but they recognize revenue. Is it when received? And then they change it to when earned. So no longer is it in their hands. It, they may get it, they may not get it. I mean, most investors don't read the notes and that's where they would hide it in the, in the bottom. Then conceal liabilities and expenses. They maybe have a warranty or product liability like um, Toyota had a few years ago where they were fined over $2 billion. They did declare it, um, but obviously a lot of companies would not want to declare something like that. The fourth one we look at is fictitious revenues. Basically, ghost customers. We know the auditors are coming, so let's create a few fake bank statements or fake orders to show to our auditors. They give us the green light and they go away and we just shred those documents. Not providing for sales and returns. If we were a manufacturer, we're going to have a sale. So our, our, our products would not be sold at full price or people will be returning their toasters or vacuum cleaners or we could have sales with conditions. So we sell an item at full price with a condition that X amount can be returned by the end of the year if it's not sold. I know some of you may be thinking, these directors that cook the books must be pretty clever guys and gals. Well, I wanna show you that's not the case. Um, I wanna give you an example, Parmalat. This is the document that Parmalat gave to their external auditors when they were auditing them. It's confirmation of three bank accounts totaling over 3 billion euros. It's a fax, ladies and gents, with a forged signature and an incorrect logo. This is what the auditors accepted without verifying it. You would think now auditors would learn from past mistakes. Let's not do that again. This year we've got wire fraud, 1 billion euros, where the auditors didn't even ask for verification. They simply accepted management's um, verbal confirmation that we've got a billion euros in this bank account. Meantime, the bank account didn't exist. We're talking here of 38% of the assets of Parmalat and 20% of the assets of Wirecard, which auditors just accepted at face value. No verification. And then the last one, timing differences. Recognizing revenue too early, which is one of the main ones. Um, holding the books open into the next accounting period, very easy to do. And then recording expenses in the wrong period, Del either delaying our expenses or prematurely recognizing our expenses. So pushing them out of this uh, financial year, or pulling them in from the next financial year, depending whether we're doing very good now or very bad now. So COSO did a um, survey going back 20 years to look at all the financial statement fraud. And what they found is the average fraud in the last 20 years, well, 20 years, 87 to 2007, has increased from 25 to 400 million. The senior people are involved in the majority of cases. Average fraud lasts about two years. We're going to show you some local examples where they went for much longer than two years. 26% of the firms changed auditors near the time of the fraud. Just a red flag to look out for. Obviously, not all of them are changing. Improper revenue recognition, timing differences accounted for 60% of the scams. Characteristics of the board of directors were not noticeably different. So it was the same mix of types of people, ages, and so on. But some of the boards were dominated by a few insiders and what we called gray directors. People that should not be in those positions because of unethical past. So a lot of people say to me, yeah, but all of these are American cases. What about South African cases? Well, I started my forensic career over 20 years ago. And these were some of the cases when I was just coming into the industry. You may recognize some of the names. A friend of mine, Andre de Toy, was the whistleblower at Beige. You may have heard of Wendy Addison, the whistleblower at Lejeunet. These are all very big frauds, all of them in South Africa. He has an article on South Africa's biggest scandals over the past decade, 2020, going back 10 years. You may recognize some of the names on here. Tongart Hewlett, Steinhoff. And of course, people are always saying, where are the auditors? These are some of the logos of the companies that, are, that had financial statement fraud globally. And these are still used today to train forensic auditing and accounting students. But I don't want to just bash auditors, ladies and gents, because where were all these other people? 
we can't just lay this at the auditors. Where were the honest directors? Where were the honest stock analysts like Merrill Lynch, who were telling the public to buy Enron shares knowing what was going on behind the scenes? So why are auditors not finding more fraud? Well, basically, they need to look at four areas. They need to look at the people, the management and directors, the, the, the ethics, and they need to look at their relationships. Are there any related party transactions? They should be comparing how the, their client is doing with its industry. And if their client is doing very well, how come the, the competitors are not doing so well? And then the financial results and operating characteristics. Ladies and gents, from your experience, where have you found that the auditors tend to focus all their time and effort? Which quadrant? One, two, three, or four? Okay, I'm assuming you're thinking number four. Number four is where the auditors tend to focus their time and effort. Quadrant four. Thank you, Shukun. They are leaving out one, two, and three, which actually gives so many more red flags. We can make a piece of paper say anything we want to. Income statement, balance sheet. So the trick is to, as this book says, fraud examination. That's one of the textbooks that I've been using in my training over the last 20 years. We need to focus on changes. So we need to look at last year's financials of our client and look at what has changed to this year and then look at the environment and look for any discrepancies between the company's financial and non-financial performance. That is how we find fraud. Let's take one of the biggest cases in America, Health South. The prosecutor said, your revenues, your assets, your profits were increasing, but you were closing down your clinics. You were doing more with less. How is that physically possible? It's not a red flag to you. And if we look at these South African examples, Tongard Hewlett used three of the five financial statement fraud scams, the three in yellow, and Steinoff used numbers two, three, and four. So the fraud is blatant. It's not as though it's one type of fraud and they hide it very well. They used multiple types of fraud. And if you read the PwC investigation with Tongard Hewlett, Revenue is being recognized in earlier reporting periods. So they were selling property, the sugarcane fields on the north coast, before the sales even gone through, before the, the property's even been zoned, they're listing it as a sale. If it doesn't get zoned, oh, too bad, they'll just write it off. Expenses being inappropriately capitalized to assets. We're talking nine years they did this, ladies and gents. Revenue pertaining to sugar sales in Zimbabwe was overstated. And if you look at the non-financial, they had a culture of deference and a lack of challenge. Nobody wanted to rock the boat. Nobody said anything. Yet people were obviously seeing what was going on. A lot of governance failures, policies, guidelines, and frameworks not being followed. How could the, the ethics officers, the audit committees, the auditors, external, internal have not seen this? And if we look at Steinhoff, they had, they had multiple conflicts of interest where the directors had their own companies and were buying from or selling to Steinhoff. And when the auditors were coming, they would hide anything bad in these um, special purpose entities off balance sheet. Once the auditors are gone, they bring them all back on. Exactly what Enron did. Nothing's changed. We look at um, some of the directors being investigated, senior executives for tax evasion, document forgery and fraud. Not a red flag. Acquiring companies that were nearly bankrupt and paying double the price for these companies. Another red flag. They did this for nearly 10 years. People said us, but what about King 4? You have to disclose. Yes, you do have to disclose. Here is a disclosure example. Out of the 17 principles, the first three relate to fraud and ethics. Look at principle one, this disclosure. It's nearly half a page. It's more than half a page long. This is about the directors and their integrity and transparency. Number two, this is about the ethics of the business and the training and awareness. And principle three is about anti-fraud, prevention, detection. Wow, if I saw this disclosure um, relating to King 4, I would want to invest my money in this company. Who is this company? It is Steinhoff. This was a disclosure made in October 2017, two months before the CEO resigned, often um, announcing what was going on. 
And of course, a whole lot of books have been written now. It's appeared in U Magazine. All the non-financials is what would have given this away of the type of people that were running the business. So ladies and gents, that concludes my session. Um, I'm gonna hand over to Emil, who will take you through, well, what happens now? If you were a shareholder in these companies, what could you do? Could you sue these delinquent directors or not? Great, uh, Mario, thank you. Thank you very much for that. So you've prepared your case and you are at my office and we are ready to rock and roll. But now before we get into that, I need to just advise everybody that's, that's, that's tuned in that you are being set up by the webinar host because the moment I'm going to tell you what your relief is in terms of this, you're going to realize there's actually not any kind of relief. Um, it is actually quite a nightmare. And uh, that is a great platform to set you up to, to hear the great solution that Investure has got to offer you. But here goes, let me take you through what your options are and how you're going to, to deal with this, uh, this situation. So uh, let me just get my PowerPoint going here. So very interestingly, what we need to, to realize is we need to start uh, somewhere. And the best place for us to start and to give you guys the, uh, the context of what is needed is I need to, to take you guys through the, uh, the context of the relationships between the directors and the, and the shareholders. All right, so let me get into that. Very interestingly, if you have a look at what, I've, what I'm showing you there, um, you'll see it's actually very simple. You will see that I've got a line from the shareholder pointing towards the company, and then there's a line from the director pointing towards the company, and then you will notice something very interestingly. You'll see that the shareholder's arrow does not point to the director. And you'll also see that the director's arrow doesn't point to the shareholder. Now, if you've got that grasp, this concept grasp, then we've gone a long way, then I'll be ready to step down from it because it looks like it's simple if you look at it. But in actual fact, it is very, very far from being a simple uh, context when you look at uh, when you look at these relationships so it is definitely definitely not simple for instance let me explain to you the concept so a cannot sue b for damages if b caused damages to c c need to act against b not a all right so if that didn't make sense then you're the right then you're in the perfectly right place for me to address the following principles to you to follow as to exactly what i am going to be telling you all right so let me look at what your your rights are very importantly where do we find our rights and uh, how do we deal with it so if you want to look at that the the rights we find um we find primary rights and we find secondary rights and i'm also going to say a bit about your sources of your of your rights now very interesting and i really love this picture of the judge that you see here um it's uh, it, it's how we feel when we do go to court isn't it we feel that the judge has got something against us and the judge just wants to nail us but in actual fact we actually don't understand the law um, and that's frustrating to judges so that's when you've got a situation where a judge gets frustrated with you you're trying to enforce a right You've got no right to be there and uh, it makes it really really difficult um, for for you to force your case in a in a court especially if you don't have any rights that you want to try and enforce okay so let me take you through it where do you get your your sources from your from your rights well you get that from your memorandum of incorporation and if you are investing in a listed company then you've probably never seen the memorandum of incorporation of the company but that's the skeleton of the company that allows it to operate, that tells the company how to operate. The next area where you do find your, um, your rights, you'll find that in the common law. And the common law comes from the, uh, the way that the, the, uh, the courts have been interpreting the law through the ages. And that has created a certain standard in how we do things. And that is known uh, mostly as the common law. And then we've got what is called the Companies Act, which is very relevant to our, to our circumstances. Now, what is important for if you want to enforce a shareholder's rights, um, like we've got in this instance, you've got your case prepared and you've brought it to me to pursue, 
then it's very important to note um, the, the following. It is important to note that you've got two sets of rights. Your first set of rights is called what, what we like to call the primary rights. And those rights are attached to your shares. And when those rights are attached to your shares, the moment you've got shares, you are entitled to these rights. And, and some of these rights might be that you have a right to participate in a decision-making process. You have a right to certain information on the company. And you also have a right to any dividends that may have been declared. So that's your primary rights as a shareholder. The secondary rights that you've got refers to the kind of rights that you want to exercise to protect the primary rights. So secondary is there to enforce the primary rights. But here's the catch. Here's where we struggle with this. When we want to exercise our secondary rights, we need to acknowledge that those rights are limited. There are certain limitations imposed on us when we want to try and exercise those rights, okay? And those limitations are the following. There's three of them. The first one is what is called the majority rule rule. And it means that you bind yourself to majority decisions within the company. You say that if there's a resolution, it can be a resolution can be passed on a majority uh, vote, Therefore, I will be bound to whatever the majority decide. Then the second limitation on you as a shareholder exercising your rights are what is called the internal management principle. And this means that the court does not get involved in the manner that the company is managed. It also means that you cannot complain about the board of directors' decisions. You cannot complain that you're not happy about the decisions. You cannot complain that they're not doing X, Y, and Z, or you cannot complain that the decision is not in the best interest of the company. The court says you wanted to be bound by this board. You wanted to be bound by this company structure. You will need to live with it, and you're not going to have any recourse on it. So you are bound by the management structures of the company. Then the third limitation on your right is what, it, what is called the separate legal capacity. And that's the one that's, that's causing all the havoc now with, with Steinhoff, is we struggle to grasp the effect that the company is a separate legal entity. That's why the arrow from the shareholders ends in the company. The arrow from the director ends with the company. The company is a separate entity and that company needs to act on its own accord. And that poses a great limitation on shareholders for when they want to exercise their rights. So the effect is that you've got a brilliantly prepared case for me, but now we need to recognize that before we even start with your case, there are so many limitations on you, limiting your, your litigation powers. You are so restricted in enforcing your rights because these three rules are going to count constantly against you. All right, so what is then the uh, shareholders supposed to do in this, in this regard? Well, let me take you to the next slide. So the shareholders recourse. Our recourse is what is called a general meeting. You've got the litigation, the common law, and this is where I'll get stuck at. You'll have litigation in terms of statutory law, and by litigation I refer to you going to court. That's why you're here. We want to enforce your rights. And then I'm just briefly going to say one sentence about liquidation and criminal prosecution because those two options are also, are also available to you. You also note the picture. You've got a soldier there with, with, a, with some sort of a gun there. Uh, that's what I think we look like when we launch litigation proceedings. All right. So that's why that's there. And we feel very, very in, intimidating and powerful when we start. But the challenge is it's not that easy. So let's look at it. Our rights are the following, okay? First of all, you have what is called the general meeting that is available to you as a shareholder. At the general meeting, the shareholders need to raise their concerns with how the company is managed. And at the general meeting, you need to get the relief that you are seeking. The challenge that you've got with a general meeting is you are faced with the majority rule restriction. So if there's a majority decision against you, you're not going to get the relief that a further challenge that you've got is probably if you are a shareholder in a listed company, you don't have sufficient shares 
to call a general meeting, which means you're going to need to wait to one day this company has a general meeting to have your issue raised and properly discussed. So that's not really for us great relief to give us any recourse in terms of the damages we're suffering. This then brings us to the common law. And the common law has got a general rule. There's two general rules. And when attorneys tell you that there's a general rule, then what you need to understand and recognize is that there will most definitely be exceptions to this general rule. Okay, so here's the general rule. It's not my fault. I didn't create the law. This is the law. The general rule is the following. If a shareholder wants to recover damages from the company, you want to, keep, you want to hold Steinle liable for what they've done in reducing your share price then you need to recognize that you as a shareholder cannot sue a company because the company breached its duty to you to manage its affairs properly to avoid the reduction in shareholding price. In other words, you cannot sue the company if there's a reduction in your shareholding due to mismanagement of financial statements. You cannot say, company, it was you that had to do it. You had to protect my rights. The reason why this is, is very simply that if the court grants a shareholder a right to enforce this remedy on the company, then the shareholder will lose the nature of its shareholding. What will happen is, if this remedy exists, a shareholder will cease to risk the capital they contributed. There won't be any risk to the capital that's being contributed because if this remedy exists, if the shareholder is able to recover the damages from the company, then it means that the shareholders, in effect, got some sort of a guarantee it can use to recover the loss. So the court says that we're not going to give the shareholders this remedy because it's against the nature of a shareholder. And the nature of the shareholder is you're putting the, the, the money in, but you are aware of a risk. The moment you talk to me about a type of a guarantee that needs to be issued, you're completely out of the Co Companies Act landscape. You're now back in what is called the phase legislation. You're busy with a financial product where you want to guarantee the capital. That is not a, a shareholder company relationship. So they cannot exist this remedy. And the courts went further. They said that if you want to push this remedy further, the end result is the, the, the shareholder will pursue the company for its losses, and in the end, it will end up just being a creditor of the company. And that is not what shareholders are all about. That's not the nature of shareholding. So we don't have that recourse against the company. Okay. But now, there is an exception to this general rule. It's the following. If the shareholder can prove that he or she was induced by a misrepresentation to subscribe to shares in a company or to sell shares at a fake price, then you have a recourse against the company. What can then happen is you can claim against the company a rescission of your sale of the shares and essentially you can claim a refund. Your second recourse that you've got, if you were induced to selling your shares and later it comes to your attention that you sold it for a very, very uh, low amount, they, they, they made these misrepresentations to you, you should have had a lot more, then in those instances you will be able to pursue the company for a damages claim. Okay, so now my eyes lit up because now we can pursue the company. But here's the challenge that you've got. We will need to prove this. We will need to prove a misrepresentation. And in order to do that, we will need documentation. We will need financial information. We will need to show what was put forward to you to make the decision. And we will need to show the court that those actions from the company, those financials, really motivated you to get into this transaction. The challenge that we've got is to get that kind of documentation from a listed company means that we need to follow what is called a discovery process. 
a discovery process is where, where we exchange documents to see what are we going to use to base our case on. And in order to get that done, we need to launch a summons against the company. The problem that you've got in launching a summons against a company is it's going to take you three years before you are actually in court. And it's probably going to cost you almost three million rand to run a case like this. Because what's going to happen is if we do are successful in proving the misrepresentation, you can be guaranteed that they will appeal the decision. And then we're going to add another two years to your litigation. So from your initial investment, you would probably need to pay an additional three million rand to recover your damages that you've suffered, which will be way, way, way less than spending three million rand on, on the legal cost. Unless you spend millions in your shares, then it might be worthwhile. But for your normal average shareholder, retail shareholder, it doesn't make sense to litigate for five years, spend three million rand to try and recover damages. It just doesn't make sense to do it. But that is your recourse. That is your option that is available to you is if you can prove the misrepresentation. The next general rule that I need to uh, deal with is when the company suffers a loss and as a result of the loss, the shareholders are now indirectly impacted by this loss. Then the shareholder has a right against the person that caused this loss to the company. But there is a condition. And the condition is that this person that caused the loss to the company must have had a fiduciary duty towards the company or there must have been an obligation towards the shareholder. There needs to have been an obligation from this person to the shareholder and there needs to be a fiduciary duty, not towards the company, I'm sorry, but towards shareholder. That's the condition. You want to hold this person liable for the, for the drop in your shareholder price, prove to the court that he's got, he had a fiduciary duty towards you, prove to the court that there was some sort of an obligation on this person that he had to you. So how does that work? In the Steinhoff saga, we saw that it's basically impossible to rely on the Companies Act to say, based on the Companies Act, the directors are liable. Okay? The Companies Act didn't work then. So what did they say? Well, how does it work? It works as follows. If you want to prove that the director had some sort of an obligation, some sort of fiduciary duty on you, you don't look at the Companies Act. You look at the facts of the matter. Every time, every case, every fact is different. Examples can be, if a memorandum of incorporation gives a certain right to the shareholders, and they, for instance, say that the director needs to ensure that the best possible share price is attributed to the sale, then there's a fiduciary duty. There's an obligation on this director to the shareholders. In that instance, there is a duty, and you can hold the directors liable. The courts have found that where family relations are, are, are involved in a company, which is not the case of listed companies, then based on family relations, you could say that there is another link that can be drawn to an obligation or a fiduciary. So to summarize in terms of the common law, shareholders can sue the company on the condition that you can prove a misrepresentation, extremely expensive process, extremely time consuming process. In the alternative, you've got a recourse against someone that caused you damages, but that someone you need to prove had some sort of fiduciary duty or an obligation to you. Trust me, it's extremely difficult to prove this, to prove an obligation or a fiduciary duty. You don't have the Companies Act to support you, or you don't have anything you need to rely on the facts of the matter. Then very quickly, the statutory law. So those are the two remedies that you've got. Company misrepresentation, individual, yes, did this individual have a duty to protect my interest? The statutory law, I don't want to go into way too much because what happens is the statutory law, statutory law worked and relied on the Companies Act to put the claim together and we saw how that didn't succeed um, in front of the Honorable Judge Unterhalter. Um, and I don't want to go into too much details because my time is running up. 
but the essence of it is they basically had two sections that they finally relied on. They finally said the financials weren't there, it wasn't up to date, and based on that, there was a negligence, reckless trading of the company, and they relied on section 2182 and section 26 of the Companies Act. And they lost this case on the statutory basis. Because they said that the section 218 that says that anybody can sue anybody for any loss that you suffer based on a contravention of this act needs to be interpreted with the rest of the Companies Act, it needs to be interpreted with common law. That is, you are restricted to the uh, you are restricted to uh, within the company. Your claim can only land and fall in the company, it cannot extend to the directors. What happened with section 20? Section 20 wasn't successful because they couldn't prove that there was a duty on these directors and based on the duty they had to care for them. So they weren't successful uh, in that regard either. So your only recourse was available statutory from Judge Unterhalter. He said you can rely on a derivative action in terms of section 165 of the Companies Act. Now briefly, all this means is the Honorable Judge Unterhalter says that a shareholder can act as a superhero in certain circumstances. They can come to the rescue of the company and say, you know what, I'm going to enforce the company's rights against these directors. You're going to fight off all the other directors who's not going to agree with you to do this. You're going to have court litigation, you'll fight them off, you will enforce the company's rights, and then you'll be, do even a very selfless thing which superheroes do, the proceeds of all your litigation will get paid into the company's bank account and not your own. So that's your relief. Your relief in the company, only against the company of misrepresentation. Alternatively, if the person had an obligation or a fiduciary duty towards you, you can go for that person. Further, alternatively, the Companies Act only says that you can rely on a derivative action and the proceeds of that action gets paid into the company's bank account and not your own bank account. Okay, so in closing, that doesn't sound really much like relief. Uh, liquidation is a great option. If that ever happens, then the liquidator can fight your claim and criminal prosecution of the company and the directors are always nice because it uh, gives great leverage on you to see the guys, to see if they can settle your claim. Okay, so that's your relief. There's no relief act. Okay, that's all from my side. Thank you. Neil, thank you so much for making a very complex topic a little bit more understandable. I'm going to hand over now to Imbolela um, from Investure. Right. Thanks, thanks, um, Mario, and thanks, Emil. Um, yeah, so good day, everyone, and thanks for, for joining. Um, my name is Imbolelo. I'm uh, from Investor, I'm one of the co-founders there. Um, so as you've heard from Mario, um, fraud in listed companies is actually quite a significant risk. And what you've heard from Emil is that it's, it's actually quite difficult to recoup your fraud losses. Um, it's very costly and it also takes a long time. Um, so at Investor, what we've done is we've developed a simple and cost-effective solution um, for innocent investors who are concerned about this, a way to transfer that risk away. So you know, I'm going to basically take you through what Investro does, um, take you through two very well-known examples that Mario touched on, and then tell you a little bit about how we distribute the product. So at Investro, we've developed an exciting world-first insurance product, and this product protects investors from losses caused by allegations of management fraud and dishonesty. Um, so in, as you all know, fraud is a very, very difficult risk um, to predict, um, even in other cases. When it comes to, to listed companies, it's almost impossible um, for anyone to, to predict the loss um, or price it or, or sort of really deal with it in any way. And even the most sophisticated professional investors have been found um, or have been blindsided by these types of losses. In the case of Steinhoff, you had a number of asset managers, some of the largest asset managers in the country, losing out um, in that loss, along with a lot of other smaller investors. And the same goes with Tonga, Juliet, EOH, and other cases. So unfortunately, um, 
the number of cases of these types of losses is not as low as what we'd like to be. In fact, it happens quite frequently, both internationally and locally. In South Africa, since we've launched, um, and we launched in May of 2018, um, we've paid claims on 12 different events. Um, and I've got on screen there some, a number of other types of events. And what triggers these, 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 these losses can, can differ quite, quite different, um, quite varying. So in some cases you have accounting fraud, um, that's a very common one. So um, a number of those fall into this group. Uh, but you also can have um, breaches in regulation or law, like what we saw with MTN in Nigeria. Um, you can also have um, misleading shareholders, um, which is what we saw with VW in the case of the emission scandals, and also Tesla. Um, some of you might remember um, when Elon Musk tweeted incorrect information out there, and that caused the share price to react in Tesla. So there's a varying number of things that can cause losses, um, and even criminal things. So EOH um, allegation had an element of criminality around it, around corruption. And that, in fact, just, um, just to note, that caused one of our biggest losses. We actually protected an investor from losing over 50% on, on EOH. So again, it's, it's quite, a, a, quite a variety of things and caused losses under this policy. And it, it, it's um, happening more often than most people think. Um, I think I mentioned just now that we, we, the policy itself, quite an interesting thing about it is it responds to, to allegations and losses caused by allegations of management fraud and dishonesty. And a good example is what happened with Capitech. Um, so Capitech was attacked by an activist short seller and they accused them of accounting fraud. And in the end, that wasn't proven. But Capitech shareholders lost 28% um, after following that allegation. And our policy also responds to things like that. Um, and another thing I'd say is that, you know, these types of losses, as you often see, can cause sudden, um, unexpected, quite severe losses. And many of the time, it can be sustained. In fact, uh, this fraud is one of the main causes for companies just going out of business. And two recent examples internationally that I can cite of this that have happened in this post-coronavirus period um, are Luck and Coffee. Um, Luck and Coffee is almost like a Starbucks type of company. It's a Chinese-based, but it's listed on the New York Stock Exchange. And they were accused of accounting fraud. And that triggered an over 80% loss on the day. Um, and since then, the company's dropped even further um, and it's been at that level for quite a while. Uh, it's also triggered even more ramifications because the US government, following that event, started looking into other Chinese companies and taking actions against companies listing on the New York Stock Exchange. And Mario also touched on Wirecard, which is a German company, um, and they do transfers, so money transfers. And they were also accused of accounting fraud, um, setting up fraudulent accounts in the Philippines um, where they had said they'd been holding billions of euros, which turned out to be in, untrue. And that caused the company to, to basically lose pretty much all its value. It's actually now filed for, uh, for bankruptcy. So in both cases, multi-billion dollar companies going completely bust. So just to tell you and explain how the insurance product actually works. So it's quite an innovative product and it's got quite something we're really proud of. Um, it's a parametric product, um, which means that the claims, uh, we don't actually evaluate claims in the way that you'd normally see. The claims are based on information that's known between us and the client. And I'll explain how that, how that works. Um, so, if you're a client, you would then go onto your share trading platform. So we are currently live on Easy Equities. So Easy Equities clients can see our product as they buy their shares. And as you buy or invest in a company, you have the option to tick a box to add insurance. And the insurance cover costs um, 60 basis points or 0.6%. So if you're investing 100 Rand, it will cost you 60 cents. And that gives you a year's cover um, from fraud. Um, so if at any point within the year, 
the company you're investing in is accused of fraud, our insurance would kick in. And, that, and it's really simple to, 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 to kind of purchase and manage it, and it's all done online. So we integrate with trading platforms, which allows us to get the information we need to issue the policy directly from your trading platform after you give us permission. And it uniquely, it also allows us to get information about claims, which I'll talk to just now, which makes the claims experience really, really sim seamless. So the product responds to two things. So the first is, it must be an allegation of management fraud in the media against the company. And the second is that that allegation causes or is accompanied by a 10% drop in the share price within two days on an intraday basis. So we monitor as soon as we pick up news about a company, we then monitor the share price and at any point if it drops below 10% of what it was worth before the news broke, we then open up a 30 day period for our clients to then sell their shares to claim. And to claim, all you have to do is literally sell the share. And if you sell the share at more than 10% loss, we cap your loss at that 10%. And the coverage in the policy gives you quite deep cover. So it covers you for, you know, so the first 10% is for, your, for you, so it's the access, but then we cover up to an additional 60% of the share value. So it's really, really deep um, insurance cover. So just to give you a, like a number as an example, so let's say you bought a share at um, 70 Rand, um, and so you invest in this company, the share price does pretty well, six months later it's worth 100 Rand. And then an allegation of accounting fraud is made against that company. The next day the share price drops to below 90 Rand, so it's dropped by more than the 10% within the two day period, we would then open up the 30 days for you to, to claim on the policy. You decide to hang on and see how it goes, but on day 29, you decide that you're gonna sell and the share price on day 29 is 50 Rand. We would then immediately pay you a claim of 40 Rand, which would mean that you get 90 Rand in total. So the 50 Rand you sold the shares for, plus the 40 Rand claim. And, uh, yeah, the 40 rand being the difference between 90 and 50, thereby capping your loss um, at just uh, the 10 rand. And so it gives clients the ability to really invest with confidence, knowing that, you know, if there's something you don't know about that company, something, you know, nefarious or fraudulent, you would be covered by our insurance policy. So Mario touched on these two real life cases um, a little earlier, so I won't go into too much detail, but I think these graphs give a really great depiction of exactly what we're talking about. So on the left hand side, you have Steinhoff, which is a really famous example. In fact, the Steinhoff claim event happened while we were doing development of the product. I think we'd already priced the product, but um, we were now working on the IT side of things. And, in December of 2017, basically Steinhoff lost over 90% of its value. As you can see now, when we talk about sustained losses, it's still at a really small fraction of what it was worth. And, and that's what happens with these types of losses. You know, if people lose confidence in that company and it really, if the company doesn't go out of business, it can still adjust the long-term value of a company quite significantly. On the right-hand side um, is Tongart. So Tom Hewlett had kind of a staged um, kind of news pattern. So initially news broke, but it wasn't complete. I think the company kind of released a sentence announcement to the market, hinting that something might be wrong in terms of its accounting. And then later on, they then gave the market more information. So it kind of dropped in two stages. And from, a, from, for our, from our perspective, um, when the news wasn't quite clear, what we did is we, we kind of gave the clients the benefit of the doubt and we paid them claims based on the, the value of the company before the initial um, claim event happened. And again, Tom Mart was one of the events where we actually covered quite a number of clients and, and really delivered quite a large number amount of value to clients. Um, the biggest claim on, on Tom Mart we protected the clients from 40% drop. So as I, as I 
kind of alluded to earlier, we we have a, our distribution is quite digital, so we integrate directly with trading platforms. So we're live with Easy Equities. We've been live on Easy Equities since um, um, May of 2018. And in that time, we've covered thousands of Easy Equities clients offering um, them this insurance. And it's a really seamless type of insurance experience where, as you can see on the screen, um, you've got the option to add insurance um, to any investment you make. If you elect to do so, you then um, accept our policy wording. And once you do that, we will then issue you your policy in a, in a few seconds. And, and you, once, once you accept the terms, we also show you exactly how much the insurance will, will cost. So it's really transparent. You're also able to, to cancel insurance from these equities. If you sell the shares you had covered, um, we issue you a refund directly on the platform. So it's really an end-to-end digital insurance experience for, for, for Easy Equities clients. But if you don't invest on Easy Equities, we've also got our own um, direct platform, which I'll show to you now. So it's www.investure.insure, where you can insure any um, shareholds, shares that you hold on other platforms. Um, so let me just demo that for you guys. Um, there we go. I'm sorry, I'm just getting to the right screen here. Okay, so this is our direct to consumer platform. So if you have any shares um, that you hold outside of these equities, you can use this. Uh, platform to come and cover your shares. So I'll just show you how to get a quote if you want to get an idea of how much the insurance will cost you. Um, so again, it's investor.insure um, and you can just go to get quotes um, and it's quite easy to, to get a quote on, on this platform. Um, so let's just take uh, ABN Dev. Um, let's say you hold the shares with Alan Gray and you want to insure 100 shares. Um, you just add that there, and yeah, so it will give you basically what your premium would be. So if you had um, shares worth 90, almost 97,000 Rand, the annual premium would just be 582 Rand, basically. So yeah, um, that's what we wanted to say to you. So it, just to close off, um, as Emil said, you know, and, and you know, there's quite a clear risk here. Of, of fraud. Um, we've covered, we've paid our claims on 12 different events. We've sold over 22,000 policies, um, just showing that people um, realize that there is this risk out there. Um, and it's something that before the insurance product was, you know, you have, you have the legal route, but it's really difficult. Um, and this gives you an easy way to really transfer the risk of fraud to an insurance company. And, um, yeah, so as an investor, we provide the technology, we've developed the product, but at the end, um, the end insurer who issues your policy is Compass Insurer, um, and Compass Insurer is owned by Hanover Re, who is also our reinsurer, and they're the third largest reinsurer in the world. And so it's really quality um, paper behind the product and capital sitting behind the product. So you can be rest assured that, you know, when the time comes, the, your claim will be paid. Yeah, so yeah, that's all from me. Thanks. Um, Shane, do you have anything to add? Nothing to add from you. Thanks. Great. Mario, you're on mute there. <laughs> oh, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Mbolelo, and thanks, Emil. Um, ladies and gents, I hope you enjoyed the webinar. Um, financial statement fraud is a very real problem, and shareholders are losing billions globally, and all we're doing is saying, here is a potential solution. You can try and go the legal way. They even tried um, a whole lot of people getting together, class action lawsuit. It hasn't worked, so what other recourse do you have? So it's something to consider. Uh, we will be running a further webinar um, next month. Um, keep on the lookout for that. We don't know the topic yet. 
Um, if there are any other questions, 